Okay, let's get started. For this new installment of What Can We Learn From, we are going to concentrate on the work of one of my favorite contemporary figurative artists, Kota Sasai. I've been following his work for years now, and there was something very primal that attracted me towards his work from the first time I laid eyes on it. There is an underlying discipline to what he does, a very specific schooling behind his paintings, but what I appreciate the most is the fact that his work speaks about a sense of liberty. I don't know if it's a right gained. I sometimes really think about how necessary it is to learn something first to gain the right to then transgress those teachings, to try to search further. There's certainly a lot of people that believe that for you to take that step, you should have a sense of mastery of foundational philosophies. But I don't know if that's necessary in painting. Sometimes I question if the development of an artist has to always go through the same beginnings, that we all have to share that arduous task of learning, quote-unquote, how to draw, learning proportion, learning structure, learning underlying anatomy, learning perspective, learning color theory. I don't know. I don't think that going through those things is absolutely necessary for you to only then have the ability to say, I will walk down my own path now. I don't think so. I think that if you have a sense of self-knowledge, if you have the conviction of knowing what you want from the beginning, you can walk down that path with no education at all, and you expect the road to be your teacher. So I don't really believe that there needs to be a proof of academic achievement underneath an expressive painting so that it can validate future questioning. I don't. As a person that enjoys all the academic efforts that human beings have gone through, specifically in drawing and painting and sculpture, I love to get a feel for that when I look at work, but I don't think it's necessary. As I was saying in Kota Sasai's work, I think that strength is there, and by strength I mean the level of commitment that he has in his mark making. I think that can only come from being incredibly secure about your decision making. And usually that sense of involvement comes from years of getting used to the way you react upon a stimulus. In a way, you grow fond of and become familiar with your reaction, with how mark making denotes the way you feel about something. But I really believe that comes with repetition and iteration and the investigation of how those marks were effective or not. And in Kota's case, I think it's also the willingness to explore. The fact that he can go back to the same fountain, which in many cases, it's self-portraiture. He can look at himself and just reinvent himself constantly in the way he interprets his own essence. In a very Rembrandt way, it's not about the objective of finding an iconic way of representing yourself, but it's more about the eternal flux of form and the way perception is shaped and changes constantly. And maybe that sounds like something that's easy to do, but it's not. It's very, very difficult. Our brain gets so used to something that is familiar, and if we are able to represent it effectively, it already equates those conventions of how we represented something efficiently and thinks, okay, that's the way I solved something well. Those decisions made for a good painting. Even if we don't want to, our brain kind of stores that data and thinks that it already knows how to solve something. And it's not something arbitrary. It's a self-portrait. So it is probably the subject matter that we are most familiar with, that we are most in tune to seeing and evaluating every day of our lives. So to be able to reconfigure a motif that seems as stable as a self-portrait, I think it's a mark of genius. And I think Kota Sasai does that as brilliantly as I have ever seen anyone do it in art history. He reminds me of one of the greatest expressionist painters ever to have graced painting, my favorite expressionist painter of all, Chaim Soutin. I think he has Soutin's energy, which is something that's almost impossible to describe because I think there's very few artists in art history that pack a punch to the gut like uh, Soutin is able to do with his paintings. 
every single portrait, every single still life, every single landscape of Soutine generates a storm in your brain. It makes you question how form is depicted, how form is understood, how form is translated. And it's not just about taking these random chances. In Soutine's work, it is about shifting and exploding gesture with so much energy that he's able to hold on to the essence of what's familiar to us human beings, but depict it in a way that is completely new every single time. So he can do series of works where your subject matter is the same, but the way he attacks it through painting, this very primal urge to interpret it through painting creates the most wonderful bit of chaos that you'll ever see in painting history. So for me to say that in Kota Sasai's work, there is that essence of Soutine, it's the biggest compliment I can ever, ever, ever pay to a painter because I really do think that Kota touches that sense of genius that is present in Soutine. Um, and the other artist that he reminds me of is Auerbach. Just the almost careless way in which he takes on drawing, uh, the very mundane way in which he wants to react through drawing, the repetitive manner in which he sees subject matter. But it's not repetitive in the sense that it becomes boring. No, it's going back to something, but with the urgency to represent it afresh, anew. I think that that's so, so difficult to do. But again, I think great artists and great artists that have that sense of responsibility, of discipline with their own artwork. They are the ones that can go back and always paint something with those wide eyes that are observing something for the first time. I think Kota Sasai bears all of that, and it's so plain to see. It's so pure to see. I don't think anything is forced. I think expressive drawing, expressive painting, it could be solved by the most energetic of mark making, but the pulse of it is never overwhelming. There's always a sense of calmness to it. Again, to me, it's almost as if Sutin had resurrected in a small town in Japan, and we are now blessed to see that same essence in Kota Sasai's work. It's difficult for me to find ways of describing how much his work moves me without sounding hyperbolic, but I think in this case, his work is not only something that I look up to, but it's something that I truly, truly connect with. For this particular piece, I tried to take on it, not in a way that is quite reminiscent of Kota's work. There's like this somber, very kind of heavy quality to his work. That's especially exemplified by his use of tone. In his more uh, recent works, he's using a lot of heavy, dark mark making to imprint a, a brooding sense of drawing, drawing as an anchor on top of all his looser mark making. All of those things I am deeply, deeply connected with. I really think that that speaks my language. But since this series is not really about attempting to copy somebody who I admire because the world only needs one Kota Sasai. You know, in the same way the world was very grateful for having one Chaim Soutin, we can all say thanks to nature for giving us one Kota Sasai. So it's not my job to just rob something that I see in him that is quite beautiful and quite pure and then stick it on my work hoping that it can imbue it with all these wonderful qualities that I have described. No, I think our job when we look at somebody who is that powerful, somebody whose work can transmit you know, very strong feelings, is to say, where do those feelings lie within me? And how can I echo that sense of urgency within my own work? So I thought that I could follow formally some of his decisions, particularly in his materials. Amongst the drawing slash painting that he does, he chooses to work with oil pastels. And I have worked with oil pastels before. It's not a new technique to me, but I've never worked with them for long enough to generate a relationship, a true relationship with my materials as I do with oil paints. So I was very eager to go back and explore that relationship, explore that new meeting with these tools once again. And one of the decisions that was going to be clear in my mind, and I guess this was a way of attempting to have past learnings from the videos that we have done this year, was to say, I'm going to hold on to this notion of high chroma. I think the willingness to attack saturated hues 
has been a bit of a constant in the videos that we have done. So I didn't want to let go of that, even if it doesn't quite coincide with the essence of color that you can see in most of Kota Sasai's work. So I thought that that little deviation was necessary for me because if I didn't do that, I think I would have been a little too tempted to just make a Kota Sasai, to just explore the hues and the tones that he works with and immediately go to very heavy, dark mark making as a sort of contour solving device. I think I would have gravitated towards that a little too naturally, let's say, and it would have been almost like a trap for me because I look up to Kota so much that I think I wouldn't have been able to escape the very enticing world that he presents to me. So I thought it was good that the way in which I was going to interpret color was not necessarily echoing a lot of what I see in Kota's work. Remember, with these series of videos, it is not about copying someone. There's no point in copying someone aside from you know, attempting to do a study and to investigate how somebody works. But I think there's more nuance to what we are proposing here. What we're attempting to do is to figure out why somebody's work moves us and how all the information we gather from that reflection can feed into our work and hopefully make it more powerful. So yes, that first decision to sacrifice some of that tonal range and hue range and exchange it for higher saturation was a very conscious one. And as soon as I started working with patches of these very, very bright colors, I was like, okay, this is no man's land for me. This is completely new. Somebody dropped me in an unexplored planet and I'm flying by the seat of my pants because I don't know what I'm doing. But I kind of embraced this, I don't know what I'm doing feeling and said, if I'm going to be expressive, this is a perfect opportunity to do so because it's very predictable to be expressive with something that you know well. Let's say I feel comfortable with solving hands and I'm going to take all that knowledge that I have of what constitutes this notion of hand and I'm going to use that to reinterpret it, to reconfigure it in something that is very expressive. And I think that that's a good, efficient recipe for expressionism. But here I thought, what if we are bold and committed to something that we don't know about? <laughs> what if we react with confidence to a situation where we feel completely lost and we're just being reactive? We're just answering to this call that our gut is making. Trust your intestines. Trust that feeling. Because if we want it to be true to the essence of Kota Sasai, to the essence of Sutin, then we have only one choice, and it is to obey our gut. So this sense of blind commitment, this wanting to explore something that is completely new to me, was essential for making this image. I was floating in the middle of the ocean, not having any sort of ground, because I usually use form as an anchor point. And for me to completely destroy form, like the three-dimensionality of form, the notion of volume, the way form traverses space, that to me is something that I know, that to me is something that I understand, that is my safe place. If I can interpret form, then I feel like I can hold on to something while I'm working. But in a very true expressionist manner, what happens if you let go of that? What happens if you just react? What happens if form breaks apart? And it breaks apart in this mosaic of shapes that are not articulated, that they're just kind of smashing into each other, creating these very abstract rhythms. That gave me a heart attack because at some point you realize, I don't know what I'm doing. And I think it's okay to not know what you're doing. But I think that you can't just float aimlessly in this acceptance of not knowing. I think instead what you need to do is to say, it is time for me to attack this, to feel like this pool of uncertainty is the perfect place for me to say, commit, commit, commit. Decisions that are constructed in a place of vagueness can sometimes be visualized really, really simply because they are kind of out of context. They feel like they are not attached to that vagueness. They feel like they're wanting to express a sense of order 
even though you have no definition for that order. I don't know how else to express how that feels like because I've grown accustomed to being in these very strange places where every single decision that I make feels wrong, where whenever I feel like the work is resolved, I look at it and I'm like, I have no base for judgment. And there's something that feels awkward about it and wrong about it. And I think that that's wonderful because it kind of tells you that all the tools that you have gathered through your schooling, through your experience, through your hard work, they are not useful when it comes to judging these new encounters. They are pointless. And to feel so empty, to feel like there is no information that you hold that can aid you in gauging this experience is very scary, but very amazing. I think that that's at the core of the greatest of expressionism, which I think Kota Sasai is an example of, because you no longer latch onto the physical world. You no longer latch onto nature. You are tapping into how something feels. It is your job to then say, how do I translate feeling into mark making, which is a lifelong process, if you ask me. And it is one of the most wonderful blessings to encounter when you see somebody who does it so masterfully as Kota Sasai does. Again, this was a video that I'm very grateful for because it gave me an opportunity to connect, I think, two of my favorite painters. One past painter, which I believe is the greatest expressionist ever. You could put neo-expressionists in that list, but I do think that um, Haim Soutin is the greatest of them all. And I love when painting connects us. I love that there is a Soutine Phoenix reborn in Kota Sasai and the world is all the better for it. So one of the things that I enjoy the most is having the excuse in these videos to just have a conversation, a visual conversation with painters that I enjoy so, so much. That's going to be it for today. We'll see you again next week with a new iteration of What Can We Learn From? Thank you. Bye.